Well, I have a ton of questions for you, but I have to just say first, how much fun was it to do Cousin Topsy's Upside Down House? Uh, it was fun. <laughs> a big, big, big challenge. Yes. Um, I mean, we just had to think about how we would do it, and I, I could only think that we could dress it right side up. Right. First, that was the only way to approach it. So um, we got the plans from John's from the art department, and, and in the prop department, we constructed the set out of sheets of plywood, based rough dimensions, and then we started shopping. We shopped for three months, just buying everything we could possibly buy everywhere at all the antique markets all over England. And because we didn't really know what it would, what would be where or what we would need. And finally, we assembled everything. Um, I had a scaffold built that I could go climb up, lie on my back, and hang my head over, <laughs> and look at the right side set upside down, which sort of worked, but it wasn't really revolved, so it, it only worked it a certain way. Um, but there were all kinds of other tricks with our iPhones. And then once we settled with John and, and uh, Dion and, and understood what everything was, every, all the breakable things, of course, everything being attached upside down was a kind of safety issue for well, we the had, actors. We had Meryl Streep and all these children yeah. underneath, and we're hanging grand pianos yeah. and grandfather no clocks. And, <laughs> so. and, and the set was literally built upside down. It's a 360 set that we had secret doors to get into. When you stood in it, you could look all the way around, and you were standing on the ceiling, and you looked up at the yeah. floor, and it was up above. And you really didn't know what it ultimately would be until you were done. Yeah, it was it's true. We didn't. We didn't have any idea, really. We knew we wanted certain things in certain places. But we had to cast everything in lightweight materials. So anything that was particularly heavy was cast. I mean, it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces that were cast uh, in a lightweight material. And then we hand painted it, all the vases, all the Chinese vases. Everything was painted. And then very precisely measured on the floor of the upright set. And then those coordinates were taken into the main set that John had built upside down. And then those coordinates were transferred to the ceiling, what, what would have been the upper part, or the floor um, of, of the set, and we attached everything that way. We, we also wanted the, 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 the cast and the kids to walk from the upside down doorway down to the ceiling, and we wanted to do it for real. So we actually had to construct a set and work with stunts and work with the actors so that they could step over the top of a door onto the bottom of the shelf, onto another bottom of a shelf, to a bottom of a fireplace mantle and kind of cross across a real fire and grab a statue that had an upside down sword they could step on, an upside down shield, to upside down bird cages. They're all reinforced to take the weight, to fans to finally get down on the floor. So the, what you see in the movie is actually the actors and the kids yeah. really walking down the set. We also had a lot of choreography in that set, so we had to be really careful about head height clearance and what, where the dancers, and so that nobody would injured. So in the early stages, we had a cutout of Mary Poppins put on a large stick upside down, and we'd walk around the right side upset with the upside down Mary, making sure she wouldn't bump into you know, the grand piano or whatever. Um, and that, that was a way to now? help solve that. No, and then we ended up uh, having sections of the floor, which was the ceiling, <laughs> that could raise and lower down into yes. camera. Okay. And then a big challenge was, it's a musical, and it's so much fun developing the musical numbers with Rob Marshall and the dancers, but normally when you walk into a space, there's all sorts of things on the floor you can use to dance on. But we were dancing on a ceiling, so there was nothing. So that's why the idea that the chandelier became something they could jump on and swing on and uh, put in a, an, an angled kind of atelier window so there was something they could run up and slide on. Uh, but that was a challenge. Um, so... <laughs> One of a few challenges, for sure. Um, what was your, uh, both of you, what was your first reaction when you were approached with the opportunity to reinvent a cinematic classic, I'm hate to say it, that was regarded by many, myself as a child as well, as practically perfect in every way? So how did um, you guys find your own voice that really respected as well as it has uh, the, um, 
uh, and ma but make it your own. Well, I think the answer to the question was yes. <laughs> Let's do Mary Poppins. And actually, uh, we had been talking to Rob Marshall about a, a film of Mary Poppins for nine years. Wasn't necessarily the film that this turned out to be, but we, we all loved Disneyland, and we had designed the ride even before we designed the movie. <laughs> so when Rob called and said, no, we're actually doing it now, it, was, oh. it, was, it wasn't that big of a surprise. But it is nerve-wracking, because it's a beloved story. And something that was helpful for us was that the first meeting with Rob, as he said, this is our movie. We're not, it's a completely different story. We're not recreating the first. And the script really made it for us to make something that was different. Yeah. So even, even the house at Cherry Tree Lane, the storytelling required it to be a different house. It had to be a little smaller in scale, had to have a very different feeling of the family inside. So Gord was able to make it a house that was much more for the children than the one in the first. Yeah. I mean, the situations in our film were different completely. So, but Rob, Rob really felt like we needed to make it our own film. But we also really wanted to honor the the sort of spirit of the original film. So we I, we all did look at. You know, we've obviously all seen the original film, but you you kind of had to put it aside a bit because we didn't want to recreate it. But we certainly wanted to have the feel of it, and certainly in the architecture of the house, the way it, it has a very similar feel. It, it is smaller. But the family is different. It, the, you know, his wife has died. The housekeeper is kind of a bit batty, doesn't look after things. <laughs> so the house is a bit run, not run down, but neglected. And uh, so we were very conscious of that and that it was a very warm family home. It was it, it, almost the, in the original film, it was almost sort of military, the way the father ran the house. So yeah, it, and uh, the, in the first one, the father at the beginning, of course, he changes at the end, but wasn't very connected to his kids and the family, and it wasn't a family house. Yeah. And right from the get go in our film, I mean, literally, the children are running the house. And the, the fun thing for what we do, and everybody here who's talking today is, you know, we just don't try to build pretty sets. Our sets are there to tell the story. So you read through the script and see what the story is expressing. And then we try to build sets that through the scale and the color and the furnishings and how it's lit, you know, wouldn't it be great that actors don't even need to say a line? You just come into the space and based on where the camera is and the, the, the rest, you get a sense of what's going to be happening. So they're really storytelling sets. Yeah. And our sets were so, our story was so different from the original that it made it a lot easier for us. As a coder, of that, I guess see that attic was one of the most beautiful attics I've seen on film. It was just, uh, every detailing of it was so rich and, and honest, and uh, it was really beautiful. Well, we actually, we had the most incredible team of painters and carpenters. I'd say. But I still said, I want to use real wood. Mm. There, there's, there's, I think we all feel this way. You, we like building sets. I just so loved listening to you, to you talking about, the, about building everything. And it's important for actors to come in and see the space. And we actually went out and found old reclaimed wood. And we, we used all of the problematic natures of that. If you couldn't find a wood that didn't have a notch cut out, we still used it. Because it was right and it was real. And I find that actors really like that. And in, and in our film, three of the main actors are children. And for them to be thrown into green screen environments is tough. So even. Even in the animated sequence, we built as much as we could, even though it might be painted green, but they could interact with and, and see. Every time uh, the animation team came up with a new cartoon character, I immediately blew it up full size. And so when you walked into the theater, there were like 50 animals in the audience, and the, the penguins were there. Yeah. And, and it just gave, gave you a real sense of fun. And, and eye lines, and when you heard the music, and there's dancers and moving the penguins around, I mean, it just the whole thing came alive. Yeah. Well, also for the attic sequence, I think we owe a lot to uh, Dion Beebe, um, our cinematographer on our film, who lit our sets beautifully. And um, he was really helpful in that set as well. And that, that's a, actually, I'm going to get on my little lighting soapbox again, because you, you, employed so many different things. You had gas lights, you had bicycle ba uh, battery lights, and electric lights, and... Yeah, we, we, in London, there, there are still gas lights around the city. Mo and mostly it's electrical, but we, in the 1930s, was just on the cusp of um, things being turned in, you know, moving towards electric. 
but you know we obviously all love the romance of of the the flame so where there was a lot of experimentation at, at the beginning we we did a lot of research on on the kind of uh, flame that you know was nicest to film and, and they ended up with a kind of fan-shaped flame so all of those little <clears throat> tips uh, uh, had to be made. We hand made those all. Uh, so it created a certain kind of arc. And then all the, the street lamps were all, came from a company that has made street lamps in London for like 150, 200 years. And so we ordered from them and they were cast in Scotland and, and in India and shipped to us. And um, then the electric department, not only were they, we called them hybrid lamps. Well, we, because we, we, we ended up choosing the lamps, adding decorative details, coming up with ways that yeah. the lamp lighters could turn them on and off, creating the most beautiful fan shape, getting the brightest flame we could. And then, of course, our DP, who's our dear friend Dion, came in and said, they're not bright, bright enough. enough. <laughs> what you going to do? So uh, Gord ended up working with the electrical team. And there's actually electric light inside yeah, up in all the of dome. those at the top. If you yeah. see the movie, you'll see this kind of coal-shaped spot at the top, which is really hiding an electric light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> but that, the, the gas lights were really outside, mainly um, you know, in the lamps. So everything else we electrified. So it was kind of like a retrofitted gas lighting in the houses and the interiors. Well, and you two, what I love about you two have worked together so often and, and the relationship with, between you and with um, Rob Marshall yes. is remarkable. So how do you decide, John, how, how does, because you've got so many things to deal with. You've got dancing and animation and trying to capture most of it in camera, but, but how do you divvy that up? How do you arrive at that process? Well, it's interesting. We've been able to work with Rob for so long. It was the uh, first time we worked with him was Chicago. And he cast the creative team in the same way he cast the actors, which is much effort. So uh, he, he met with so many production designers and heroes of mine, famous production designers. And he waited and waited and waited until somebody told him the idea that was in his mind. And in, in Chicago, it was this idea that, that Renee, when she goes into her mind, I wanted to, to do then theatrical sets that had, had pieces of what was in the real world that she was disappearing. And of course, that's what Rob had wanted to do for four or five months, but nobody had said it back to him. <laughs> so he ended up getting this creative team that thinks very, very much like him. And so while we communicate constantly, and we're very visual in the way we communicate, through mood boards and illustrations and models and, and even cardboard mock-ups of full-size sets, um, it, it feels that each movie, he needs to talk to me a little bit less. And at, first I, at first I got really, I was like, well, I'd go to Rob, or I'd go to Gord and say, Rob's not talking to me much. <laughs> Gets lonelier and lonelier Yeah, at the and top. then Gord said, what's he doing? And I said, he's working on the script. I go, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I've got a follow up on that because, uh, and actually, I was reminded again when I was watching the the dance around the fountain, which I think is the fr uh, first time I've seen a dance around a fountain since American in Paris. I think uh, you guys took it back to um, a wonderful memory. But you know, uh, you've really, um, through Rob, have discovered and mastered an art of staging for the cinematic musical moments. And uh, I just want to understand a little bit more about your collective process, working together for conceptualizing, communicating, rehearsing, yeah, uh, a big designing from the rehearsing, and then realizing those musical sequences. Because it's that was, you know, at the, in the height of the studio system and at MGM, it was a high art, and they had really done it well. And we lost all that knowledge, and you guys have reclaimed it. So I would just like to understand how you have reclaimed it. Well, making movies is hard work, but it's so much fun. But making a musical is the most fun of all. If any of you gets a chance to do a musical again, like we do with everything, just say yes, because it's fantastic. And you work with Rob Marshall, you actually make the movie twice, I tell people, because he's the choreographer as well. So he'll bring the Arctobot on a little earlier than you normally get brought on. 
and we'll sit and talk about what the sets could be, the, the big musical number with all the gas lamps in, in an abandoned park set. The initial brief was it just needs to be a place in Ludden hidden in plain sight that maybe the Learys would go with different levels. So we looked at old abandoned tube stations, we looked at a variety of things, and then the idea of something like a section of Kew Gardens that was actually at Regent's Park, and for some reason, 100 years ago, it was just a lock was put on it, and it's got overgrown, but it had all the elements that you'd want for a dance, because it had the idea of different levels, and it had and, and angles, and ramps, and staircases. So we, we did a mood board to kind of talk about that, and then uh, Rob talked very briefly about some of the styles of dance he would want to use. And we went off and came up with some ideas for the set. And we, we, before they could do the choreography, we had to have an agreement with the visual look of the, of the set and the size of the set. So we have the fun, as we said, with the storytelling of it, what is the set's telling, but also what it's providing for the dance. And we will go in and set up a huge dance hall for Rob, and we'll lay out that set, as we did with every musical set here. We laid it out full size in a dance floor with a sprung floor. And Rob and his team of dancers and choreographers go in and just start working. And so I had made some platforms that represented the fountain just out of wood. I would made some staircases. Before the ramps came, they were just staircases. And then I'm down there three or four times a day, and it's absolutely magical because he's not only just working with the dancers, he uses live music. So there's a piano player, there's a drummer, and you just literally see the set come to life. So you know, at a point he decided he wanted lamps around the fountain. Uh, he called me down, I called my art department, we all stood on chairs with our hands, <laughs> pretending that we were lamps. And we, we stood there for two hours, like lamps, <laughs> while dancers jumped on the chairs with us, hung off of yeah, us, ran around. And it then becomes about scale. Then you start going, well, well, how far is the lamp from the fountain in order for them to jump? Or you... Uh, or they want to spin, or they want to do a certain yeah, maybe, kind of movement. Maybe the initial movement was a spin across right. three times. But as they're getting into it, it, it really is better to do it five times. Right. But you'd run out of set. So I get a call <laughs> down, and I come running down with my tape measure and my masking tape. And we talk it through. Rob shows it to me, shows what the dance move is. And then we throw out ideas. I mean, it could be this, it could be this, it could be that. He usually picks one, and then we quickly build it. Um, and so the next day, they're able to dance on the, the, the different sides and see how that works. And, and there'll be, there was a famous story on Chicago with the staircase that uh, we said, let's start it at, a, at 12 steps. And they danced on it for a couple hours, and they called me in and said, I think it should be 14 steps. <laughs> so great. So I had the carpenters build extra steps when they went to lunch, nailed them back on. I got a call two hours later saying, well, shouldn't it really be 11 steps? <laughs> so that night, we cut off all but 11 <laughs> steps. And they came to work, and they just kept going up and down, up and down. And I say this with joy. This is nothing, no, no complaint. It's the process. It's a creative process. So once it lands on what it is with, with, with the dancers and the choreographer and the director, uh, particularly with Rob Marshall, gets pretty locked in, and you feel safe to build it. But then everything you're building has to be danceable. And uh, different types of dance need to have slick floors. Mm -hmm. Different types of dance need to have sticky floors, some in between. Uh, so that Grip, abandoned park. grips on the you know places for uh, dancers to put their feet on the lamp. You know we we had to change designs so they could rest their feet on things. Put in little. They, they wanted correct. to swing around yeah. and they could swing around a couple times, but we wanted them to swing six times. We so had we to said, put a, let's put a little lazy Susan into the lamp yeah. house. So, so we had to have an engineered yeah. sort of yeah. you know bearing uh, yeah. turntable that they stood on. That and was and we usually them. have like minutes to do this. So. <laughs> Rob would come in at 10 in the morning and take a two-hour lunch and usually finish dance at 5 and go do other things. So we knew that we had a two-hour period at lunchtime. If he wanted something, I had carpenters building it. As soon as he left, we'd stick it in. And then I, we also knew at the end of the day that we had time at night in the morning. Yeah. But, it, but for the first few weeks, the sets change a little bit, if not drastically, overnight. So that when he comes in, this new sense of scale and movement and things that make it better for the dancers is already there for them. 
For our part, we can't really give Rob any props or any furniture unless it's the thing we are going to use. So very early on, you have to understand what it is. If it's part of a dance number, uh, you have to understand what it is very quickly and find what you want to use, and that's what it is. So there's no like, oh, this is a certain shape of chair, but you know, when we come to shoot it, it's going to look like this. No. So it, yeah. Um, well, and then I'm going to just build off of that because not only that you did you have to do the musical number, but you also had to design for animation where it's all going to be done in post except for the coordinates of the actors dealing with certain physical objects. So how did you guys reconcile working in that empty white page with the necessary elements knowing what it was going to through conceptual work, knowing what it's going to be in the end, but not knowing how it's going to come together. It's absolutely no different. Is it? No, it's absolutely no different. If you know you're going to have a carriage and a park and trees, you need to know what kind of carriage it is and what kind right. of park and what kind of trees. We did the exact same mood boards that we'd always do, whether you're building a set or whether it's a location or whether it's something that becomes animated. And then the musical number was actually done exactly the way I've done, we've done with Rob on every one of his musical numbers. He's very Broadway-based. So you, we built the stage, we built the books, we built uh, the, the, the trees, the staircases. Um, eventually, when we went to shoot, it was all painted green. And then the animation team did a beautiful job painting in the animation and attaching it over. But that was a physical set that was rehearsed for, for off and on for three months. Yeah. And that had quite a staircase, because if you've seen the movie, there's a piece where Lin-Manuel Miranda gets up to a high book by the penguins throwing a series right. of books. And we must have rebuilt that 22 times. It's like, well, it's, it's, it's 20 books to get up. And then it's like, well, no, now we want to curve it and spin back on itself. And then so we had, books. no, so we just had hundreds of, of wooden block book shapes that we'd be constantly going in, literally all night long, reformatting where they would go. And with Rob, it's not just a, it's a book. It's every book is a different height. And it's incredibly specific. So, you know, he's going six inches here, eight inches, back to six, two fours, and, and all physical. So it, again, when we went to shoot, it was all painted green. Uh, but even on rehearsals, we had taken we had taken some of the animation drawings and blown them up full size and attached them to the green set so that when the, the kids came in, it wasn't just a green world. You got a sense of what that would be. And we had the models that we built of the set, and we had all the animation drawings. Wow. All in a day's work. Yeah, no fun, really good fun. Thank you so much. <laughs>